Good morning. My name is Don Sharp, and today is August the 23rd, and uh, we have three new stories on a history of New Orleans and the North Shore of uh, Louisiana north of Pontchartrain. <clears throat> on the table here, I have four ring notebooks and a, and a, uh, a regular library book. And uh, first of all, I'll tell you about the three stories are, one is about the two, boy, two men named Gilbert. One is called Gilbert Antoine D. Maxen. He's the uncle. He's there in the small book. His nephew is Gilberto Gillimard, the surveyor. Uh, who is important to the history of Louisiana, uh, especially New Orleans, because he's the one that designed and built the three main buildings in Jackson Square or the plaza. One of the most famous, of course, is the cathedral. It's the oldest extended running cathedral in the United States. And there's a lot of history. They want to uh, maintain it, keep up it, keep up the uh, maintenance. They keep the going. The book here that, that I have and the picture on both books is a drawing. This book was written by a man named Julian Coleman. He wrote the book in 1968. It's a brief book about Gilbert Antonio St. Maxon, early New Orleans in the French period. But the interesting thing about Gilbert St. Antonio de Maxon and his nephew, Gilberto Guillemard, is a little town in France where they came from. This is in this uh, volume here. I'm, I have the picture that's called Longy. L O N G Y. The French spell it several ways L O N G W Y. You look on a map of France and see Paris. A little to the northeast of Paris, on the German and Belgian border, is the town of Longy. And I have a beautiful pictures of it was built as a fortress. It was a little country town and a man by the name of Vobo, V A N N A of N A N. The French spelled it Vobo. Sebastian Sebastian Vobo. He was the greatest military engineer in the history of Europe. And he built over 300 fortresses and palisades and stuff throughout Europe. He took this little town, this little village, scraped it to the ground, and he built a fortress. These two men who made the history in New Orleans were born there and raised there. They had influence in their background, military influence. This is one of the reasons why Gilberto Guillemard was called on by the Spanish to build so many fortresses. And later in life, when Cronolet was governor of Spanish Louisiana, he was worried about invasion from France. He had him build Fort St. Philip down by New Orleans. Where did they get this knowledge to build it? From Longy. So if you want to know about where they came from and the, and the influence of a little French town on New Orleans. So the first story is about these two men and the early history of New Orleans. What is interesting about it and what is important? Historians drop the ball. When it came time, 
when Gil, Gilberto Gilmore, the, uh, the surveyor and builder, left New Orleans in 1805, they said, where did he go? Well, they didn't know. They couldn't find any records. There was no computer in those days, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. So the historian said, oh, he went back to France and died there. No, he didn't. He did not. <clears throat> this will tell you, Gilberto Guillemard had a family, a little family. He had a wife. Her last name was Bizador, B-O-I-S-D-O-R-N. Her father was a surgeon in New Orleans and a military man. Mm. Uh, but... Um, and they had a son. The son was called uh, uh, Ronaldo. Arnaldo. A-L-A-L-U-L-D-O. When he was 18, his father and his uncle got him a job in the military. Spain was in control of the North and South Shore. So uh, uh, Arnaldo got the position of a lieutenant at 18 in the Spanish military, and they sent him to Pensacola. When he was in Pensacola for a year, he bought a lot in 1804. He later married a Villery girl, that was a commanding captain and colonel later on. That. So when Gilberto, his father, left New Orleans. He went to Pensacola, where his son was and his daughter-in-law. But the problem was he only lasted a few years. The story is about the family and how they wound up in Pensacola, and the, and the story is very interesting. Gilber uh, Gilberto Guillemard, the builder of these three famous buildings, died in three years. How do I know? Primary source material you'll see in the book and everything. News, I'll say newspapers, and you'll say, what do you mean newspapers? Believe it or not, they did have newspapers in those days. One was the National Intelligencer in Washington, D.C. Hmm. I have copies of it. And they, were, they had lists of the soldiers and people who were leaving. Spanish Louisiana was transferred to French, to uh, um, uh, Americans went in the uh, uh, um, purchase, the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. And they were making a list of the Spanish people leaving. And in there was an article. Gilberto Guillemard, the archivist, He's going to Pensacola. That's one of the newspapers. They have several articles. So people, if you doubt that I, he did go to San, you can look at these several articles that I have, primary source material. Well, he gets down there. But the trouble is he left under trying circumstances. He was not paid fully for building those three buildings. He was brought over by a man named Morgan Edward, uh, and he was brought to uh, the North Shore to do a survey. And he did a beautiful survey. It was pre-Mandeville by far, way before Marigny, and because they had a, a land dispute. Coronelette gave a land grant to a man, Jacob uh, Miller that he shouldn't have given because the land was already taken by Mark and Edwards. So that's part of the story for 12 years of, of uh, Gilberto did that and he wasn't paid for it. He wasn't paid fully because right after he finished that survey, uh, Mark and Edwards died, but uh, Andres Alamasters, who was contracted by the Cabildo, to build these buildings. He financed them. Gilberto Gilmore wasn't pay, paid <coughs> uh, for his 
uh, building of the buildings. Alamaster's wife <coughs> uh, uh, refused, the widow refused to finance <coughs> the rest of the building of the Presbyterian. The Cabildo gave uh, uh, Gilberto part of his money, but he didn't get the rest. Hmm. And so after the uh, uh, Louisiana Purchase, when all of them left, uh, but a few, Gilberto stayed trying to get his salary. He didn't get it, and then uh, uh, Governor Claiborne was tired of him and the intendant staying around, selling land uh, fraudulently across the lake, told him to leave. So uh, Gilberto Guillemard goes to Pensacola where his son was. And he, he's over there, but he's penniless. One of the letters of the Spanish government writes to another one saying that Gilberto Guillemard uh, has no financial means now. Hmm. Uh, Pintado, who was a surveyor over in Pensacola, but gave him a few jobs of surveying. But anyway, he married in 1787 to Felicia Bizador, uh, the daughter of the surgeon. Uh, and uh, uh, her brother Louis in New Orleans suggested that uh, the father, the surgeon uh, who had a, a land grant, got a, a land grant, a huge land grant, and um, on the Gulf Coast, would they could take that and sell it and make some money that way if uh, Gilberto would write a letter to the intendant Morales to get a survey done. He wrote the letter in April, but he died. The notice came out in New Orleans that he died November the 27th uh, in Pensacola, and he was buried the 28th. They had a new cemetery that opened up, St. Michael's, just the, the, the year before, and it's possible, most likely, that he's buried in that cemetery. Hmm. But anyway, Gilberto, nobody knew about this. This is not in the, in the, uh, the history of the builder of uh, the three buildings. So this story here, in volume 29, is about his last days in Pensacola and the story of his son, Arnaldo, who was a um, officer in the Spanish. Uh, Spain retained the North Shore even after the uh, Louisiana Purchase. And um, uh, so he went over there, he wrote the letter to Nintendo's Morales to get a survey done for his father-in-law who died, the, the, uh, the, the grant that he got from Miro, the Spanish governor, in 1783 uh, was from Bay St. Louis to the Pearl River. Hmm. Some statements say 100,000 acres, some say 400,000 acres, but it never was surveyed. So this letter he was writing for his mother-in-law was to get a survey done so they could sell the land or something. It went to the courts, the Supreme Court, for several, for many years. The final analysis was, since they didn't know no boundary, and they had no uh, definite uh, divisions of where that uh, grant was, they couldn't give it. They did uh, honor him, the family, and they gave him uh, uh, 1,200, 12,000 acres. But anyway, what happened in November is that Gilbert Gilmore died after three years. Nobody knew about that. And he's buried in St. Michael Cemetery. He left his wife a widow. That's why the street was named and his, and his son, Arnaldo. Anyway, what happened was General Andrew Jackson in the history, made several trips there to clear the Spanish out and to get the land for the United States. His son and his father-in-law were 
10 other Spanish officers wrote a letter to the newspapers stating that Andrew Jackson didn't treat his fairly about uh, these officers fairly in the, in, the, uh, in the survey. Andrew Jackson was so upset that he banished them. He wrote a, he was a, a temporary governor of Spanish West uh, on Pensacola there for about uh, 12 weeks, three, uh, three or four months. He banished them from the uh, uh, colony. Uh, they, the, the uh, uh, yellow fever started to rage. And it's all in this book here. They, were, they left these officers for Cuba, uh, for Havana, Cuba. But while they were leaving and then on their way to Cuba, Gilberto Gilboa's wife, Bizadour, dies of yellow fever. They find that out and they, they come back and they write it. They, uh, Andrew Jackson was not the governor anymore, but uh, who was taking his place. He told him to put him in prison. But uh, the guy, the governor, temporary governor, told him he put him in a, a temporary prison in, uh, in their homes. They wrote a letter to the United States Congress stating that it was unfairly treated. But, and Congress, the President of the United States, issued an executive order to the Secretary of State to release Arnaldo Gilmore, the son of the, the uh, uh, Gilberto. This is the story that, that is untold and it's in here. So this is the first story of the first family of New Orleans. Why do we call it the first family of New Orleans? Going back to Gilbert Antonio St. Maxon, he married and he had nine children. Seven of them were girls. Two of them married Spanish governors. Anzaga and Galvez, and they they formed a family. And for many years, he was one of the richest and persons and important people in New Orleans. This is all in this first story. No. The second story is very important. It's a man called James Rumsey, and his influence on the North Shore history is that he started experimenting with steamboats 11 years before they even have it in the history books and he was on Bayou Lacombe and uh, the story of how he uh, was born in England the historians really distorted this story they couldn't find out the history of him so uh, uh, they bought a false story made up by his nephew that he was born in Maryland. But he wasn't born in Maryland, he was born in Bristol, England. But anyway, and he went to Illinois as a merchant for nine years. Then he came down to New Orleans. He was interested in steam and he started experiment with steam. Hmm. So this is about where was he? Where did he start these experiments? He, he started on a little branch bayou, three miles up from the lake, and it was named Bayou Rouville for a reason, a very good reason. It's part of the large land grant that Governor Vaudrill under French times gave himself, a 5,000 acre grant, and it's on a Tobin map that shows you exactly what. So we have a very, we want to identify where Rumsey actually started his experiments. It's so important to the United States. It was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. It was only six years after James Watt was experimenting and uh, at Glasgow, Scotland, and he improved the 
uh, a steam machine to lift water up by adding a condenser. So this is the second story, and it where uh, it tells uh, how Rumsey uh, was he was doing he started in. September of 1774 coming down from Illinois mm. and he was going very well. Uh, Jock Hertel Rouville, that's another story, died and left a widow. She allowed him to do his experiments on, on the uh, bayou. and uh, But while he was doing the experiments, he wanted ultimate secrecy. And it, over there, it was still very unpopulated and very... But here comes Francois Cousin. Francois Cousin, a few years earlier, took advantage of the British when they had it, and he got a land grant on Bayou Liberty. He had a business called making bricks and with timber, and he had some ships. Well, he decided he wanted to expand, and he heard about uh, Bayou Lacombe. If you ever been there, it's a beautiful bayou right directly across. So he applied for a land grant to Peter Chester, the English governor. Chester said, if you bring your slaves and all your equipment there, you can get a land grant. Mm -hmm. So he, they gave him a land grant above where Rumsey was doing his experiments on the Vaudrill plantation. But Rumsey wanted secrecy. Uh, but uh, uh, um, Cousin had six boats, and they would pass right by where Rumsey was doing the experiments. Mm -hmm. So Rumsey said he couldn't have it, and after less, a little while, less than two years, he moved to Pearl Island. And this is a very interesting story, uh, number two, about Rumsey. I'm trying to identify precisely where his experiments were held, because it belongs on historic places, the sites of historic places, not only in a state, but national sites, and I would like to see Rumsey get recognition. But up to now, nobody seems to have been impressed that Rumsey started fooling with this and opened the mid America mm -hmm. with the steamboats. And uh, but that's the second story, which is very important. The third story. They all connected. Back in the French period, from 1699 to 1763, it belonged to France. In 1741, Bienville was recalled back to France. They appointed a man called Pierre Rigaud Capitel de Vaudrill. Mm -hmm. He was the son of the governor of Canada, Vaudrill, who was governor for many years from 1685 or so until 1825 when he died. But as soon as he got to New Orleans there, the economy was poor. Mm. Financially, the, the, the colony was broke. He issued himself a land grant on the North Shore uh, of 4,800 orphans. Mm. What it, it started at Bayou Lacombe, and it ran westward, parallel with the trail, the high ground. And that's on a map called the Tobin map I have on there. But anyway, he keeps it for 10 years. There's a picture of his wife he married. He married an older woman, 15 years older. Mm. She had a grandniece, a grandniece called Maria uh, Samanad. Mm. 
Maria Joseph Salmonar. When they took over, uh, he got his um, grant. He started an indigo plantation. Indigo is a color, purple dye color, and it was very expensive, but it was very difficult to produce. Hmm. But anyway, Vaudrill purchased, issued himself a land grant. He didn't need 5,000 acres, but he started with an indigo plantation around Bayou Lacombe. And he had this wife. They brought the, his grandniece. She married a man in Canada called Jacques Michel Hertel Rouville. Mm. The Rouvilles are very, very important people in Canada. They kept Canada from falling to the Iroquois Indians. Not only his father, uh, 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 Jacques's father, Jean Baptiste Rouville, but his grandfather. They were so successful in getting friendly Indians to help them fight off the Iroquois <clears throat> that they, they were given seigneurs, a, a less noble uh, designation. What it was, they get, were given land, and they were entitled to own land and to rent it out to, to settlers uh, to work it. Uh, but anyway, she marries this Rouville, and Jacques Rouville comes down to live on the plantation after the, uh, uh, the uh, Vaudrills left. Mm. They lived there for 20 years. Uh, but after a few years, Canada had the Seven Year War. England beats France and Spain and get, get, gets Canada. Canada was all French and Catholic, but they they draw up a proclamation of 1763. Mm. The proclamation was very offensive to Canada. It took away their religion. They couldn't practice Catholic. They took away their civil rights. They took away their right to vote. They took away the right to purchase land or move westward into new lands. This really irritated the 70, 80,000 Canadians. The English only had 2,000 troops there, and they were very upset. So they didn't know what to do. But England turned around and did a complete about face and came up with the Quebec Act. Mm. Now, the Quebec Act is very important. It's one of the five uh, intolerable acts that led to the American Rep. This is about the American Revolution. Why, what uh, actions, events happened on Bayou Lacombe on the North Shore that pertain to the American Revolution? This man, Jacques Rouvel, Rouville, who have a bayou named after him, left New Orleans, went up there, and in, the, in this book, it tells how he organized the nobles and he, uh, to protest. It was so in, important and, and so effective. England completely reversed their position and made the Quebec Act, which allowed them the Catholic, their religion, even got them a, a, a bishop. Uh, allow them the, the civil rights again, allow them, extended the, the uh, boundaries of Quebec all the way down to the Ohio River. Mm -hmm. They stopped the 13 colonies from moving west. This so infuriated the 13 colonies and it, 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 that they, it started the war. So here you have a man called Jacques Hertel Rouville, that was living on Bayou Lacombe, that went north and organized and helped change the proclamation of 1763, that was one of the major instruments in starting the American Revolution. In 2026, they are already starting to organize and advertising. There is going to be a celebration 
of the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution, and they wanted to know what events happened down here. Historians say very little happened. Very little happened in New Orleans or the North Shore that affected. That is not true. I give you Jacques Michel Hertel. He came back after the Quebec Act in 1774, and he died in New Orleans. Mm. Soon after he died, up shows Rumsey coming from Illinois. He finds out about the plantations empty, and he goes and gets permission to start his experiment. So we have one story about the uh, American Revolution. We have another story about Rum, uh, Rumsey, and is uh, and it's very important. It changed the way we live, how we travel, how we prepared our food, and then we go to the first story of Gilberto Gillimard building the three buildings in the in the uh, uh, French Quarter that stand today attract nine million people each year. I thank you for, for the crude presentation that I did, but it's very interesting. The, the North Shore of Lake Pontchartrain, especially Bayou Lacombe, has very interesting history. The Gilmores, the Rumsey, and Vaudrill. And Va one last thing, Vaudrill about his story. I divided it up into three parts. And it, it tells you, you can go into detail. We have Vaudrill, how Vaudrill got his plantation. We have Rouville, all about Rouville and what he did during uh, living uh, with and his, how his wife uh, sold the property to, uh, to Rumsey in 1776. After Kuzan tried to uh, got a place, and then we have Rumsey. So, so all three stories on the final thing of Vaudrill. Mm.